Jesus is enough. Hey everybody, I'm Derek Lewandowski, one of the pastors at Redeeming Hope. So grateful that you would join us on this digital stream of our Sunday message as we begin a brand new series, God at Home. I'm so excited to go through this series with you as we take this opportunity over this next season to encourage the home, encourage families, encourage marriages, encourage you know interfamily relationships and walking those out in a gospel-centered way to see the power of God working in our lives together. Just so excited about this opportunity. The title of today's message is The Gospel-Centered Home. Let's jump right in. There's four values that we communicate as a church, and these are our culture builders as we build our lives together around Christ. Faith, family, following, and finding. And today we're talking about family. This series talks about family. We wanted to spend some time this spring building up the home and building up the family in this series, God at Home. Here's an idea of some topics that are coming down the pipe. Today's the gospel-centered home. Future weeks, we'll be talking about the hospitable home, using my home to further the mission of Christ and his church, and just discussing the joy and power of showing hospitality through our home, family vision, gospel-centered parenting, gospel-centered marriage, resolving conflict, some great topics ahead that we're gonna look at through the lens of scripture as we grow together and trust God to help us grow into being those healthy homes, those, those households of strength as we walk together in the Lord. Three disclaimers as we get into this message today and this series on family, on the home. Number one, if you're single or you're an empty nester out of the family season, please know there will be plenty to challenge you and encourage you. So if you're listening to a recording, don't turn this off. Uh, you know, those of you that attend... Uh, on Sunday in future weeks. Uh, there's plenty in this series for you. Don't feel like this isn't for you. As you know, we always preach Christ. So no matter what the topic is, your eyes will be on Jesus. And further, this series can prepare you for your future or help you to help others. Second disclaimer, there are things in this message and in this series that will inevitably cause regret, especially if you're in the family season or through the family season. I don't know a single parent that looks back and says, I, I done it perfect. And so there's always this sense and this, this temptation to regret. Let me remind you of a few things. Number one, God is sovereign. His plan includes your regret for the glory of his name. He sovereignly foreordained that you would be right here where you are in this season of your life with your story because he wants to glorify himself in you and your family uh, in a way that he has designed. So I want you to trust him with that. Number two, there is no perfect family. I've seen families do everything right and still watch their children walk away from Christ, at least for a season. And the lineage of Christ himself is marked by brokenness and dysfunction. Yet Christ came from that family tree. I want you to remember that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You don't know what you don't know and you you didn't know what you didn't know at the time that you were in that season when you were maybe investing in your family or investing in your children. And just know that God is full of mercy and grace and works all things for the good. And remember also that God is a greater parent than any of us. Remember that he has no grandchildren and where our parenting ends, his parenting begins and he knows how to talk to our kids. Yes, even our wayward ones. Yes, even our adult ones. Third disclaimer. I'm aware that what I'm teaching is not popular in the world today, or especially our culture. But my job, our job as those who teach here at Redeeming Hope, is not to take our cues from trends or culture, but to speak truth that transcends culture. In many ways, our society is lost without a compass when it comes to the family, yet God speaks directly to this topic. So let's not discard the blueprints. Everything God says in his word is for our blessing and our benefit. So please open your heart and your mind as I share today and as we share in future weeks. Okay, let's start here. Family is broken. Today you might say that normal is broken. And today we're gonna see why. I wanna start with a quote from Dave Harvey in his book, When Sinners Say I Do, talking about marriage. When Sinners Say I Do. What a person believes about God determines what he or she thinks about how we got here, what our ultimate meaning is, and what happens after we die. So essentially, our worldview, our perspective on life is determined by our perspective 
on God. So as Dave Harvey points out, our understanding of God is crucial to how we see and do life. And this is the most important investment I make in my family, is my faith, our faith, and our our view on God and his word. So we have to be motivated by this, that the most important thing my family needs is the gospel. And the gospel means good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and how and what that means for my life. And the best way for me to love my family members is with the gospel. It's greater than any you know, external earthly inheritance, greater than our homes, our riches, our cars, our comforts, or even life itself. So let's be careful here and make an important distinction as we talk about this. I'm not talking about giving your kids religion. The word religion literally means to bind up. I'm talking about giving your kids the gospel, the good news of God's grace. Our kids are born like cars without an engine. And I'm talking about giving them an engine that will empower their lives. And I'm talking about giving you an engine that will empower your home. Many people see value in religion for their family. And what they mean is that religion provides sort of a a moral base for their family. So they'll try to insert some version of religion into their family. But in the end, without understanding the Christian gospel of grace, it's on the outside, not the inside. If that's all religion is, a moral code, why not just join the Boy Scouts and get it from the Boy Scouts? You know, our wrestling club in the community that we have, Slingshot Wrestling Club, is a a faith-based club, and we use that to train kids K through 8 in wrestling, and we interact with a lot of families, and we're a faith-based club, and we talk about our faith, and we do, you know, devotions during practice and that kind of thing. One dad called me, and he wanted to get his kid involved in the club, and I said, that's cool, I just, I want you to know that we're a faith-based club, and just, you know, make sure that's okay with you, and he thought about it a second, he goes, yeah, we're good with that, we believe in those, we believe in in those kind of morals, our kids need those morals, and I'm, I'm just thinking, that's this guy's view of faith and, and religion. It's just, it's just morality. It's just, it's just teaching like commands and rules and morals. But when I say gospel, I don't just mean giving your kids a system of morality. I'm talking about the good news that though we failed God and failed the moral code, that God made a way for our salvation from the penalty and power of sin. And I can't overstate how important this message is. This is everything. It will shape the culture of your home. It'll shape the way you think in your home, the way you interact with one another. And believe me, something is shaping your home. And I will warn you, if it's not the gospel, then it's the legalism of human religion or the ideologies of culture, because that's all that's left in the world. If all that's shaping your home is a moral system of rights and wrongs, be this and do that. You'll either create people who believe they've achieved it at some level and will be proud of themselves and will become self-righteous, or people who think they've failed and will find the standard unreasonable and walk away from it. I'll never forget sharing the word of grace at a certain church, and and I watched a woman that a friend of mine had married and was in in the congregation that day. And as I was sharing the message of grace that you can't, he can. You didn't, he did. I just remember watching her just get mad as a hornet. She literally just angry at me and staring at me as I'm preaching with just anger in her face. She hated the gospel of grace. She hated hearing that she couldn't do it herself. And within the next few years, what she was came out. She began to be controlling and manipulative, defensive and self-righteous, never willing to admit her wrongs. Eventually, she convinced herself that her husband, my friend, wasn't good enough for her. By rejecting the gospel, she had effectively, effectively chosen to be God, to be the center of her own universe. She found a new lover, left my friend, and for a season was hated by her children and estranged from her children. I don't even know the state of that right now. Just, it, it, it was a direct result of rejecting the gospel of grace. C.J. Mahaney, author, pastor, once said, that small errors in understanding the gospel early on result in big problems later on. And, and I understand this. I was a roofer uh, during my college years and in the summer I, I had a roof job and, and, uh, and we learned the importance of snapping lines on the roof you know, because you don't have perspective. You're too close to the roof and you can't see if you're making a straight line. And If you don't have a line snapped, you'll get off and not even see it until 
you start putting the shingles up there and you walk to the end of the roof and if you just eyeballed it and didn't snap a line, you'll start, you look down the roof and you'll just start seeing this, this, this valley of shingles, this, this curve uh, in the shingles and, and you just, you don't have perspective. You, you can't get it right. And that's what happens when we have small errors in understanding the gospel. If we don't snap that line in our home, then, then we get off. If we're just basically responding to our feelings or um, our, our, our own perceptions or trusting our own hearts or trusting, God forbid, trusting culture uh, to, to teach us how to do this, we need the gospel. So here we go. Today, I want to give a theology for the family and God's plan to rescue for the family. I want to give a theology of the family and a theology for the family. Now, please don't be scared off by the word theology. That might scare you. All that means is the study of God. Here's what R.C. Sproul, author, pastor, teacher, once said. No Christian can avoid theology. Every Christian is a theologian, perhaps not a theologian in the technical or professional sense, but a theologian nevertheless. The issue for Christians is not whether we are going to be theologians, but whether we are going to be good, good theologians or bad ones. So that's the question. Are you going to, we're all theologians. Are you a good one or are you a bad one? So here's our text today. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 25. Paul writes to the church. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom... It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So here's what we're going to look at. Number one, what is the gospel? Number two, what does it mean to be gospel-centered? And number three, how does this help us in our homes? What is the gospel? What does it mean to be gospel-centered? How does this help us? Let's start with this idea of what is the gospel. Well, going back to the text, the text says in verse 18 that those who reject the word of God, those who reject the gospel are perishing. That our pre the pre-existing state of every single person ever born is that we are in a state of perishing. What does that mean? That, that means we are, we are on a path towards separation from God, toward eternal separation, eternal perishing in hell, separate from our creator. And I don't know about you, but I see that word perishing. I'm like, this is a five alarm fire. I mean, this is a dash light going off. Like, this is a big deal. You know, sometimes I watch these uh, air crash disaster documentaries on how planes crash. I don't know why. It's just an interest that I have. And uh, it, every time if they kind of reenact what happened in the cockpit, they'll, you'll hear the, the voice uh, on the dash, you know, w once it rec the plane recognizes that it's going down, you'll hear, pull up, pull up, pull up. And that's what this text is. It says, it says that the, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It says you're perishing. Pull up, pull up, pull up. What does this mean, and why are we perishing? We're going to gain our theology by looking at the very first family that ever existed, Adam and Eve, and why the, that Paul said here that we are perishing. And we find this story of Adam and Eve in the early pages of Genesis. I'm going to look in just a few texts from Genesis. Here's Genesis 2, verses 15 through 18. So God made Adam and Eve. And it says in verse 15 of Genesis 2, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. 
And then, as the story goes, they ate of the tree, first Eve, then Adam. And God follows through on his warning and explains the curse of death and sin that is now on them and their children. And here's part of his explanation of the curse of sin that entered the human heart as a result of the fall of man. Genesis 3, 16. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Genesis 4 says, Verses, uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through uh, 8. Now Adam knew, his, knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering of fruit of ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering, but for Cain in his offering, he had no regard. And Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Verse eight, Cain spoke to his brother Abel. And when they were in the field, this tragic thing happens. Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Bible teaches that we are all in Adam, that the curse of sin and death that came into the world through Adam has fallen on everyone ever born to Adam and Eve. Romans 3.23 famously says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. There's something, something in our nature that habitually sins, that, that wants to be the Lord and the King of our own lives, of our own universe, and reject the authority and rule of God, as Adam and Eve did in the garden. Dave Harvey, in his book, When Sinners Say I Do, said, marriage is the union of two people who arrive toting the luggage of life and that luggage always contains sin. Now, why is this helpful? Dave Harvey goes on. A great awareness of one's sinfulness often stands side by side with great joy and confidence in God. And we're going to talk about that. What Adam became after the fall, we now have within us. Human history has borne that out to be true. And this passage teaches us some things, and Genesis teaches us some things about the human race. By looking at Genesis 2 and 3, we can clearly see some important gospel truths and start building our gospel thinking. So let's bring this right home to where we are. Here's a few things that we learned from Genesis chapter 2 and 3 and why Paul said we are perishing. Number one, men are sinners. Men have a clear call in the Genesis creation account to lead, but as we read scripture, we see that Leadership is never domineering and hierarchical, but it is always, always, always and only servant leadership with Jesus Christ as our greatest example. Men are called to lead by being the first forgivers and the first sufferers. However, the curse in Genesis 3 tells us that not only are men sinful, but it even points to how men might sin. That men will be tempted to lead selfishly, to lord their authority, to dominate or exasperate, or men that will be tempted to passivity like Adam was with his wife. So here's the temptation for men. Instead of being like Christ, a man will be tempted to either be a chauvinist or a coward. Now, there are certainly other ways that men sin, but these are common ditches for broken men. So men are sinners. That's what Genesis 2 and 3 teaches us. It also teaches us women are sinners. You getting the idea here? Marriage is two sinners coming together in a covenant that requires you to be selfless. Eve is called a helper, and this word literally means completer. Eve was called to be a completer to her husband, Adam. It doesn't mean lesser. The Bible doesn't paint, paint men as the main picture and women on the fringe. But only when we consider Adam and Eve together is the glory of God fully displayed. The Bible unashamedly teaches that men and women are equal but different. I'll be getting more into the distinctions in, in future weeks, especially in the message, the gospel-centered marriage. Now, all that said, 
Genesis 2 and 3 teaches us that not only are women sinful, but even how a woman might be tempted to sin. That the ministry of being a helper or completer would be broken from the fall. So there'd be a temptation for women to be antagonistic toward men, to fail to see their dignity and value and to fail to affirm the dignity and value of men. Genesis 3.16, God says, your desire shall be for your husband. Now, this doesn't mean you'll really be into your man. The word for means against. So your desire will be against your husband. It literally means your desire will be to dominate your husband. You'll want to take him out. It means there will be a power struggle in the home. It means a woman will no longer seek to complete or help or support her husband, but to rule over him and dominate him. We can understand further what this word desire means by looking back at Genesis 4, 6, and 7 and how the word is used with Cain and Abel. Here God rejects Cain's offering while Abel's offering is accepted. Cain is furious. His whole countenance has changed. Jealousy and murder rise up in his heart. And the Lord comes to Cain and rebukes him with a kind and fatherly warning. He says, why are you angry? Why is your faith fallen? face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Here is that same word that's used to describe how a wife will relate to her husband under the curse of the fall. Desire. In this verse, sin is described and this desire is described almost in animal terms, like, like a tiger crouching by the door. You open the door, and there it is, coiled and ready to pounce. Or maybe God wants us to think about a snake here, like the serpent, the devil. The moment the door's open, wham, sin pounces on you. Sin wants to dominate you. Sin wants to destroy you. It's out to get you by dominating you. So when God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, it's the same as saying to a lion, your desire shall be for the wildebeest. It's not a good desire. It's a desire that wants to consume and wants to create antagonism. And so we see men are sinners. Women are sinners. And it creates this tension in the home. And then finally, we see children are sinners. We read the account of Cain and Abel. If marriage is two sinners coming together, then a family is two sinful people who have cute, little, unrestrained, incredibly out-of-control, selfish sinners. Children are tempted to be like Cain, self-centered and divisive, destroying community in the home. They'll seek to dominate the home over their parents, over their siblings. They'll seek, in a sense, to functionally be God. Now, children are cute, but children are incredibly sinful. They're born selfish. And if untamed and unaffected by the gospel, that sin will rule over them, as we saw in the story of Cain and Abel. And I've seen it in my own home. I've seen it in my cute little kids. Uh, when my daughter, was Audrey, was, uh, was young, uh, we, we had a, a, a cookie jar, and uh, she wasn't supposed to eat all the cookies. And they were gone, and she, we knew that she ate all of them. And so we said, Audrey, I said, Audrey, did you, did you eat the cookies? Now, I knew she did, but I wanted her to admit she did. And she said, no, 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 no. It was, it was uh, Gracie, her oldest sister. So I went to Grace. I said, Grace, Audrey said you ate all the cookies. Did you do that? No, Dad, I didn't. I went back to Audrey. Audrey, she says you didn't do it. Um, so where, where are the cookies? She said, oh, no, it, it was Joy. So I went to Joy. Joy, did you eat the cookies? No, Dad, I didn't eat them. And then Audrey said it was Essie. Did you eat the cookies, Esther? No. Audrey went through ev every single sibling. She blamed every single sibling. Just like, just like Adam and, and Eve blamed one another. You know, uh, Adam said, the woman you gave me. He didn't own his own sin. So finally we said, Audrey, we've talked to everybody in the home and it, it wasn't any of them. So what happened to the cookies? And she goes, I know who did it. It was Andy Klein. Now you're saying, who's Andy Klein? Well, I will tell you, we had a plumber working in the house downstairs on our, on our boiler heating system, and it was Andy Klein. And, and I went downstairs, and I opened the door. I said, Audrey, come here. I said, Andy, I, I got to tell you, just, just for a second, so sorry to interrupt your work, but my daughter says that you went upstairs and stole all the cookies out of our cookie jar. Did you do that, Mr. Klein? <laughs> of course, he laughed. He said, I got to say, I did not eat those cookies. And we said, Audrey, was it you? Yes. So we, we see the sin nature in my, little, my cute little girl. We see the same thing that's in 
Adam and Eve. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. It wants you, but you must rule over it. Sin wants you like a predator crouching in the bushes. It seeks you. In other words, you now have an enemy within, an enemy that seeks to destroy you from the inside. So men are sinners, women are sinners, and children are sinners. What do we do from here? God's answer is the gospel. Back to our text that we looked at today. Paul says the answer is what he calls the word of the cross. So what's the word of the cross? What is the gospel message? It's two simple ideas. Number one, it's the idea that we need salvation. That Jesus outed us on the cross. Verse 18 says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. So the, the gospel says we are perishing. And we're perishing because we're sinners who have broken God's law and have sought to rule ourselves and reject his authority. Verse 21 says that Jesus came to save those who believe. So that tells us we need saving. We need salvation. And we don't just need salvation from the penalty of sin. We need salvation from the power of sin that's at work in our hearts and in our homes and and is affecting our relationships. So that's the first part of the gospel, that we need salvation. And the second part is Jesus rescues us. And Paul wrote, it pleased God through the folly of what we preached to save those who believe, to save all of those who were born broken, those who were born fallen in Adam and Eve, that this second Adam, this second Adam came to save, to save us from where the first Adam failed, to save those who believe, not to save those who impress him and, or, or save those who, who work really hard and are really religious, not, not God helps those who help themselves, but to save those who believe. What does it mean to believe? That word believe is synonymous with trust. So let me insert that in the text. It pleased God through the folly of what we preached to save those who trust in him. Jesus saves those who trust in him. Your salvation is based entirely on what you are trusting in. The gospel says you can't trust yourself, that we're broken, that we're fallen, that we're sinners. It teaches us to trust in Christ. So that's the gospel. We need salvation and Jesus rescues us. Number two, what does it mean to be gospel-centered? So remember, we're we're asking, what is the gospel? And what does it mean to be gospel-centered? There's a contrast here between two kinds of wisdom. And we see it in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. And and that's, that's rightly understood by inserting what kind of wisdom it's talking about. So what that's really saying is, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through its own wisdom. So there's two kinds of wisdom. There's God's wisdom and there's human wisdom. And the wisdom that it's talking about in the end of that verse is not from God. It's not God's wisdom. It's it's wisdom that puts human wisdom, the human spirit, human willpower at the center of the solution. It's wisdom that removes God as the solution. It's self-salvation. You know, a quick look over the last 500 years of history. In the Reformation, you had this very high view of God and this lower view of man. You know, big God, small man. And there was this this general sense of this honor and and fear in, in a sense that you're, this awe of God and this lower view of man. And then you had the Enlightenment period that came along and, and there came the rise of, of atheism and the rejection of, of the Christian faith. And so you might say that society went like this, where uh, th- there was still an esteem of God and still a value for God in society, but there was also this sense of, of h- the h- humans being the center of the universe and, and, and atheism, you know, the rise of atheism and, and the idea that man can solve his own deepest needs and his own deepest problems. And now you have the modern era, and what you might say happened there is... They have this low view of God and this high view of, of, of humanity. And it's called humanism. The religion of America is humanism, that we can solve our own problems. The religion of America is, hey, I'm awesome. That's human wisdom. Now, either, here's the thing. You are either trusting in worldly wisdom or... You're trusting in God's wisdom. 
Either worldly wisdom or God's wisdom is the center of your home. And God's wisdom is the gospel. So what does it mean to be gospel-centered? It means two things. Number one, to be gospel-centered means I believe the gospel and that the standard by which God accepts me never switches from Jesus to me. The solution never switches from Jesus to me. From Christ's work to mine. The solution is always, always Jesus. So I can never hope to earn my way to God through my merit or my morality. I have to depend on grace to save me. I have to depend, on, depend upon the cross to save me and to make me acceptable in God's eyes. So that's the first thing, being, what it means to be gospel-centered. The second thing it means to be gospel-centered is that we trust in the power of the Holy Spirit working through faith in Christ as the power source for all things, for forgiveness, growth in character, growth in our relationships, growth in our marriages, growth in our home, that the gospel is the power source. Listen to what Romans 16, 14 says, and I'm gonna quote it out of the Berean literal Bible. It says, for sin shall not rule over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. In other words, the place of power is when we're not under law. In other words, we're not basing our acceptance before God or our rescue or the solution on ourselves, on the law, on our ability to perform. We're basing it on grace, on what God has done for us, not what we do for God. Galatians 2.22 says it a little different. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died for nothing. In other words, if my acceptance before God comes through my ability to solve my own problems, to, to solve the deepest needs of my life, then I literally set aside the cross of Christ and make it mean nothing. So what does it mean to be gospel-centered? It means a standard never switches from Christ to me, and it means the power source is the Holy Spirit to change me and transform me and my home, my family, my marriage, and build us up. Okay, how does this help? How does this help? Verse 18 says, the word of the cross is the power of God. The gospel gives us spiritual power. How? Here's how, a few, a few thoughts. The gospel creates humility. When, when, when I grasp this idea that I was so bad and I was so lost that I needed God himself to come and save me, I needed God himself to come and rescue me, that creates humility because rescued people are not arrogant people. Another way to view it is the, the gospel teaches that all have sinned, right? So in a sense, we all have this, like this figuratively, this sewer pipe running through our hearts of sin. And now sometimes someone's sewer pipe might break, right? And the disgusting stuff in the sewer pipe might spill out and, and ruin some furniture and ruin some of the walls and the carpet. But let me ask you a question. Is the disgusting stuff that's still in your sewer pipe, even if it didn't break, any less disgusting than the stuff that broke out of the pipe and broke into that person's life? In other words, sometimes people mess up their lives. The pipe breaks. But I don't have any place, because I understand the nature of sin that's inside of me, I don't have any place to look down my nose at somebody else, my wife or my children, um, as if they're more disgusting and, and their sins are greater than mine. All have sinned. I have, maybe my pipe didn't break, uh, and maybe someone else's pipe did, and maybe in my home, and maybe we need to clean that up, but the gospel creates humility because I realize that all have sinned. So here's some confessions of a gospel-centered family. Number one, I need grace to be a parent. Number two, I need grace to be a spouse. I need grace, if you're a kid, I need grace to obey my parents. I need grace to be a loving sibling. I need grace to trust in God. Gospel-centered family says, God has provided what I need in Jesus. And a gospel-centered, a confession of a gospel-centered family is that I must reach out for that grace in faith and prayer. So the gospel creates humility and it drives us to Christ. How else does this help? The gospel creates healthy expectations for marriage and family. Because the gospel says, Jesus completes me. Nothing in this world completes me. No human relationship completes me. What we lacked in righteousness, he gives us. What we lacked in human love, he gives us through the Father's perfect love. 
So we finally answer the question, who is ultimate in my life? And the answer is, Christ is. Christ completes me, Christ is my identity, and Christ satisfies me, and that gives us reasonable expectations for our spouses. The world has a low view of marriage and super high expectations, and a Christian actually flips that. We have a, a uh, lower expectations in marriage, but a higher view of marriage. Why do we have lower expectations? Because I know that my spouse isn't Jesus. I don't make them my idol. I don't make them my functional Christ. And I, I look to Jesus to ultimately satisfy me, which means I'm not looking to my kids and creating this codependency, this codependent relationship. I'm not looking to my kids or my wife to be that which only Jesus can be for me. So it gives us reasonable expectations for our spouses, reasonable expectations for our children. You know, as you get older, you find out that your kids maybe aren't as into you as you are into them. And this can be devastating if your family is your idol, if your family is your emotional center. And so the gospel gives us these reasonable expectations. How else does the gospel help? The gospel gives me a vision for my home. And it's simple. It's simply this. We exist for the glory of God. That everything ought to orbit around Jesus, not ask Jesus to orbit around me. And, and everything is arranged around Christ. That it's for his glory. It's for his mission. It's for, it's for his worship. The gospel-centered home is a family in which everything is arranged around Jesus Christ and his gospel for the purpose of maximizing joy and maximizing the glory of God. And everything works that way, works better when it's arranged that way around Jesus. Sports works better. Money works better. Our, our relationship with our kids works better. When we don't make those things ultimate or make those things our idol or make those things God, but when we worship with sports, we worship with our money, we worship through our home and give glory to God. It gives me purpose and vision for my home. The gospel gives me the power to change. Romans chapter seven, verses 24 and 25 says, Paul is frustrated with his own sin and he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. So Paul's frustrated. Look, look at what he concludes with, with his frustration with himself. He, does, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? His answer is not a what. It's not something he has to do. It's not some, some you know, puzzle or code he has to crack or, or some moral achievement he has to gain or earn. He realizes that his answer is a who, not a what. He needs a hero. He needs someone to come and save him. Every member of your house will find themselves here, frustrated with their sin at some point, frustrated with their inability to be who they want to be or with some vice in their lives. And the gospel says the answer is a who, not a what. As I'm talking with my kids, I'm constantly encouraging them not to look inwardly to save themselves, but look outwardly to Christ. You know, one of my sons had, a, had an anger problem. And I said, son, I said, you know, you lost your cool again. What's going on? I don't know. Do, do, do you want to, you know, do you want to be a loose cannon? Do, do, do you want to be out of control with your anger? No, I don't want to be out of control. He's in Romans 7, 24 and 25. He's, he's, he says, I'm a wretch and I need deliverance. And so I say to him, well, what's the answer? Some of my kids have said, as they're learning the gospel, I just need to do better. And I say, no, no. The answer is not do better or try harder. The answer is Christ. The answer is who will deliver me? You need a hero. You need a savior. And we, we teach our children to look to Jesus, that he is the power source to change. So how does the gospel help us? It creates humility. It creates healthy expectations for marriage and family. It gives me a vision for my home. It gives me the power to change. It creates a culture for my home. Grace begets grace. Loved people love people. Encouraged people are effective people. And when I'm basking and saturated with the love of God toward me, I can show the love of God for others. And the fruit of the Spirit is what we all want in our homes. And, and so the gospel creates a culture that's Christ-like. It creates the same way Jesus loved us. We begin to love one another. 
How else does the gospel help me? The gospel creates a value for the church. If Jesus died for the church, then I cannot reject the church. And I begin to see the value of the local church and the value of God's people. And that becomes a big part of our lives and our family. God uses that as a means of grace to help me and help our family and help our marriage and help our homes. We're there for each other. We grow together. We, we weep together. We mourn together. You know, we tell our children as they're choosing their college uh, majors and, and where they're going to go in college, we tell, tell our children, the church you attend is just as important as the university you attend. So if we're going to be looking at colleges, we have to look in that community and see if there's a gospel-centered church that you can join with and walk with them in that season of your college years. And so all these ways the gospel helps us. Now, how, how do we apply this message? Just some quick thoughts in closing. And I'm going to read the end of the text again. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through its wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power and the wisdom of God. And so we preach the gospel to one another. How do we apply this message? Preach the gospel in your home. Gospel-centered homes start with gospel-centered moms and gospel-centered dads. And so we preach the gospel at the family table. We have conversations about Jesus, about what he's done. We encourage one another in the faith. We've used morning devotionals, bedtime stories, and these little kids' Bibles. And We have a Sunday night family night where we, we do what we call takeaways uh, from the Sunday gathering and the, and the message that was preached, and we encourage one another. Uh, and what we heard in the gospel. There's other tools that I could recommend, the New City Catechism, the Family Worship Bible Guide, different things that I could recommend as tools to help take your family through the gospel. Coach the gospel in your home. Help your kids look at the world through the lens of the gospel. Teach your children not to be thoughtless consumers of culture. For example, if, if there's an idolatrous or a low view of sex, and my kids are watching a TV show, I just did this the other day, I'll stop and I'll say, hey, that is not a good view of sex. Just so you know, that is not a holy view of sex. Uh, that's okay that we're watching this show, but let's make sure that we, we're not thoughtless consumers, that we understand that what we're seeing and hearing is evil. That is not a godly view of, of sex. Other times we use this idea of receive, reject, redeem. Some things in culture we receive uh, from culture, uh, we don't have to reject it. Some things we reject in culture, you know, pornography, we simply reject that as a family. Some things we redeem. And we do that sometimes in music and movies where we'll listen to a song or watch a movie and we'll evaluate it with a gospel lens and say, how does this help us see Jesus more, more clearly? How does this help us uh, worship God and grow in glorifying God? We also use ceremony in our home to preach the gospel to our children. For our 13-year-old girls, we have what's called a verno celebration. That's the Latin word for bloom. And we have a gathering, a special dinner for our 13-year-old daughters where we bring key women that are in their lives to that dinner and we have them speak uh, to our children, to our daughters, uh, biblical womanhood and, and what does it mean to, to live for the glory of God as a woman in this world. And it's just such a powerful time. We do a similar thing with our, our boys called Direct Us where we set up a gathering where men can speak into their lives. When our kids turn 18, I create what's called a life book, and I have people write uh, entries that will encourage them, encourage their uh, faith, and encourage their manhood or their womanhood, put those entries in the book, and I put all these little great quotes from godly people in the book and, uh, and entries from friends that they have, and I give them that book as a tool moving forward to just constantly encourage them in the faith. So we, we preach the gospel in our home, we coach the gospel in our home, and we practice the gospel in our home. And we practice that by practicing repentance. You know, that the, 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 the ones repenting of sin are not just the kids in the home. It's the parents as well. Parents, and we do it publicly sometimes to our children, or we publicly, if we, if we uh, dishonored our, our spouses, we publicly apologize and let the kids see that. We practice encouragement in our home. We build one another up. We practice grace in our failures. Don't be surprised when your kids fail or confess a sinful desire that's different than the way you sin. I remember when one of our four-year-olds, one of one of our four-year-old kids, robbed a store. And Romans seven tells us that downswings are a normal part of the Christian experience. 
but our trajectory is toward Christ, toward his holiness. But there are times when our kids will be frustrated when battling sin. And so we show grace in failure. We show grace. So we, we practice encouragement, repentance, and we, we practice gentleness and grace when our children fail. Now, maybe you're going, yeah, but you're a pastor. You're supposed to be good at this. Please don't be dismissive of this message. The reason I know and do all this stuff is precisely because I'm weak, not because I'm strong. I don't even think we do it well half the time. But the gospel has saved my life, and I teach it to my family and preach it to myself because without it, I spin off, we spin off into bad places, and my home becomes a circus. So as you hear this message today, respond this way. There's no condemnation in Christ. Don't, don't feel condemned. If, if you're saying, man, I wish I, did, I, I wish I did this sooner. Well, as they say, the best time to plant a tree, 20 years ago. The second best time, today. So begin to plant gospel seed into your home and into your family and into your marriage. No condemnation in Christ. I want you to respond with a sense that we need this. Let's hack through the chaos and reorient our lives around the gospel. Maybe we can't add an hour in, but maybe we can add five minutes a day in for our family. Uh, or time with our wives around the gospel. And finally, time to forget what lies behind and strain toward what's ahead and all the more as we, de as we see the day approaching. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. Help us, Lord. Help us by your strength to comprehend it and to walk in the power of it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And remember, until next time, Jesus is enough.